Sports uh, membership event. And again, welcome to the epicenter of the Twin Cities media market. Thank you very much for coming. And I want to make a few announcements before we start the program. Uh, first of all, can I have the ambassador stand up? Thank you very much. Bank, and then finally, recognize the students that are here. We have students from uh, both White Bear and Matamidi High Schools and also uh, Liberty uh, Classical uh, School. If you would mind just standing up, students. We always... <laughs> we really, really appreciate it when we can have our uh, young adults attend these uh, venues and programs sponsored by the White Bear Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, you'll be introduced to Senators David Durnberger and to Senator Rudy Boschwitz soon, but I want to <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, and then we have a uh, local county commissioner from the area, Blake Huffman. Is Blake Huffman here? And then I, uh, I know that we also have a number of city council members, and if you could just stand up real quickly and say who you are. And, uh, real quickly, just two other quick, quick notes. On the table, you'll see we have no cards. And then finally, after the lunch, uh, David Stockman is going to be signing copies of the... Without further ado, I'm going to ask Terry Colds, the incoming chair of the White Bear Area Chamber, to come up and introduce uh, Rudy Boschwitz, Senator Rudy Boschwitz. Thank you. Well, what a thrill to be here today and uh, see so many uh, bright faces. Um, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Senator Boschwitz. He uh, has served as a uh, senator from the state of Minnesota. He was elected to the United States Senate in November of 1978 uh, for the term commencing in 79 and served two terms uh, ending in jo January of 1991. He's served as the state chair of the American Cancer Society Crusade, the Upper Midwest Kidney Foundation. He was the campaign chairperson for the Minneapolis Federation for Jewish Service. He received a very prestigious award, a Citizens Medal in 1991 for his efforts um, in Ethiopia as President George H.W. Bush's emissary uh, he served as the finance chair for, uh, in Minnesota for President Bush, George W. Bush, in 2000 and 2004. He resides in Minneapolis. He's a famous entrepreneur as well, uh, starting a business, uh, some of you may remember, called Plywood Minnesota and the ads on TV. It was always fun to see that. So would you please join me in welcoming Senator Rudy Boschwitz. Well, I don't like to uh, introduce the Democrats, but Mark Ritchie, the Secretary of State, is with us. And Mark, stand up. And I'm supposed to emphasize, buy the book. And uh, you'll, you'll enjoy it. And this is a remarkable young man. I still think of him when his hair wasn't quite as gray as it is now, though it began getting gray uh, even in his 30s. Uh, Dave Stockman is a phenomenon. He uh, uh, was the youngest member of the cabinet under Reagan. Not only that, but the youngest member of the cabinet since colonial times, <laughs> since the early 19th century, 1810 or 20. Uh, he's, he was, uh, has an extraordinary work ethic, and when he first came, he, interestingly, he got a start in politics and in an unusual way, but so often you hear about these kind of uh, uh, quirky ways that people get into politics. He happened to be the living babysitter at Harvard for, for Pat Moynihan. And, and therefore he got into, he went to divinity school at Harvard. And uh, nothing came of that though, I, I don't believe. And, and uh, uh, he entered politics, uh, and when he became a staffer in the House of Representatives, the first thing he did was to read 10 years of the Congressional Quarterly. 
Now, despite its name, the Congressional, Congressional Quarterly is a weekly, and, and uh, it, it contains all of the doings of the House and the Senate in the preceding week, and uh, you read them all. It's a remarkable uh, a job to do that. And then he, uh, he ran for Congress, uh, came into the Congress a couple of years, 1976, you said. Yes. A couple of years before I got there and became a close associate of uh, Jack Kemp. And he also uh, was known as the smartest member of the House of Representatives. Phil Graham called him that. And Phil Graham is no slouch uh, intelligence-wise either. Uh, he was, I often said, the smartest member of the Senate. And, and uh, so he, over there in the Congress, and he became very much involved in the budget, and he uh, 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 just uh, was, was masterful in, in the amount of knowledge that he acquired. Uh, I became familiar and friendly with Dave Stockman uh, after 1980 when he became the director of the budget. And that, that is, of course, uh, that is, of course, a member of the cabinet. And he would come up to the Senate and he would talk to committees and he would say what his proposals were for the committees. And I was on the small business committee and uh, I just met a small business lender here earlier on and uh, he wanted to abolish the Small Business uh, Administration, which would have, of course, ended the term or life of the committee, and the chairman of our committee was an was apoplexy. And, and uh, he went from committee to committee uh, talking to them. And when he talked to us about the Small Business Committee, I remember it so well, we were in the Republican leader's office. The Republican leader at the time was Howard Baker, he knew much more about the Small Business Administration and what it did and how much money it was spending and what the loans were and so forth than any member of the committee, including the chairman, which caused more apoplexy on the part of <laughs> Senator Weicker, who was uh, a difficult person to start with. And then he came to the Agriculture Committee, where I also served. And, and he, he talked about the agricultural programs. And of course, they are the subject of, of much conversation with respect to saving money in the budget. And he knew more about the agriculture programs than any members of the committee, including the chairman and the staff. He is a remarkable person. I went over to their house and Jennifer Stockman, Jennifer, stand up for a moment. And, and <laughs> Jennifer, we, I went, Ellen and I went up to their house and, and we went down into the basement. And in the basement, he had a room that had bookshelves on three or four uh, walls. Were they all four walls or three? And they were all three ring notebooks about various departments of government. And he had read them all. And he knew more about the federal government anybody I have ever met before or since and he's just a remarkable man you ought to buy his book because I'm sure that it <laughs> it was it was it was remarkable to see that room in the basement with all the three ring notebooks but I'm not here to introduce him I'm here to sell books <laughs> And I'm here to turn it over to my colleague, Dave Durenberger, who is going to properly introduce one of the most remarkable young men, Dave Stockman. Well, it's always hard to follow Rudy, but I've been doing it a good part of my political life. <laughs> all, of my, all of my political life. Uh, so it's... Uh, Tom Snell is really the most unusual person in this room. He's sort, of, he's sort of like living in White Bear Lake. He's made a circuit of almost a 360 circuit around the Twin Cities and firing up uh, chambers of commerce. And he's done a marvelous job turning out people here. And he reminded me that one of the things that I helped him do was get Alexander Dubchak to come to Minnesota. 
And I imagine Dubček didn't even know where he was when he got here, but, <laughs> but uh, Snell is just uh, one of those incredible gifts to this community. So uh, he called me up and said, can you get Dave Stockman to come and speak? And this was before the book. We, we didn't even know about the book. Uh, say nothing of the size of the book. Um, <laughs> And <laughs> I said, sure, I'll try. So I sent him an email and got an immediate response that I'd love to do it, but I'm writing a book. I get a hold of me after the book is written. So this is after the book is written. Rudy's told you why it's really important. I want to make one other comment about um, the times that we serve together because uh, I just came back from Washington, D.C. with 60 MBA students who range in age from 30 to 55. They're investing a hell of a lot of money in a business future that relates to health care. And a trip to Washington, D.C. was a great disappointment, obviously, because of the environment in which we currently live. Not that the 30 people that spoke to them weren't the most knowledgeable people I could find on both sides of the aisle and from conservative to liberal and so forth, but they all agreed, you know, on where health policy ought to go in this country. And they, the students were left scratching their heads and saying, well, why don't we do it? Um, and the difference is pretty stark. Uh, I found David Stockman um, because I was looking for, <laughs> Rudy said it already, the smartest guy in Congress. Uh, must be a boring husband with all that stuff in the basement that he's reading and all these loose leaf materials. But, um, and I, I got introduced to Dave and we spent uh, a, a good part of time in 1979 and 80 beating Jimmy Carter's proposal to have every hospital in America go on, on fixed budgets. And out of that, he introduced me to Alan Enthoven at Stanford and a whole bunch of people who, in addition to Dave Stockman, helped change my life. We were both Republicans. We both were successful by finding Democrats who had the same kind of belief system we had, who came from communities that valued some progress, you know, in changing the role of government in one way or the other. And, uh, we were able to defeat the stuff that wasn't going to fit in the kind of America that we wanted to live in or the kind of healthcare system we wanted to live in. And then, starting shortly thereafter, to start moving in a very, very different direction. When you finish the, um, the book that uh, Dave has just finished, the 715-pager, I told him honestly, I read halfway through it. He, he said it to me a couple of weeks ago, and I got halfway through it, and then I started speed reading it <laughs> because I was so over. I got so overwhelmed by the research that's in it. So one thing I can I can guarantee you when you read that book, that this guy's not shooting from the hip. He's not one of the people you see on television when the on the uh, the talk shows, the media, the instant opinion on every subject under the sun. This is an unusual gift to America. The book, like his first one, called The Triumph of Politics, which is basically, it's even a better read, it's not as comprehensive, but it's almost a better read predicting what has happened between the time he served in the Reagan cabinet and today. Because you can see the triumph of politics in America. And if you change the politics and you start distorting the politics or the, to, to the extent we've distorted it today, then how in the world are you ever going to get back to changing the role of government in this country? So you are in for a real treat today and tonight when you go home and start reading that book and, and the day a couple weeks from now when you finish reading it because it's, uh, it's an absolute delight to be in White Bear Lake and Venice Heights and introduce you to former congressman and former whole lots of other very important things, David Stockman. Well, uh, Senators, thank you very much, and Rudy especially, because my wife Jennifer is here, for, uh, for attesting to the fact that I'm still a young man. <laughs> I appreciate that very much. Uh, as you may have gathered, I have had a checkered history, and that was evident when it took two Senators 15 minutes to introduce me, <laughs> two former Senators. But um, it was very different than what happened yesterday at a luncheon in which the guy said he had a long career, but he never held a steady job. So uh, that, that would be another way of explaining it. 
Um, I am glad, uh, gratified that there are so many of you who came out today who still want to hear about my book because by now the critics have all weighed in and I think some of you at least have heard that I'm not a real author. This isn't a real book. It's a, I do rants and uh, screeds and polemics and sometimes I even become unhinged uh, according to some of them. But I think that's fair enough because what I've done in this book, and I'll admit to it, is that I've taken on Wall Street, Washington, the K Street lobbies, the Pentagon, the Republicans, the Democrats, the Keynesians, the supply siders, the neocons, the social cons, and the just cons, which takes into account most of Washington. So uh, the brickbats have uh, thro uh, flown at me from every direction. But still, I have to say that I think when Professor Paul Krugman who, as all of you know, is the self-anointed tribune of correct thinking <laughs> on all matters uh, e uh, economic. Uh, but I thought uh, he went over the top when he dismissed this whole effort that I put years into as the ravings of a cranky old man. <laughs> uh, you know, I have to tell you that even aroused my 85-year-old mother who, upon reading his, quote, cranky old man blog, immediately shot me an email saying, doesn't he know you were actually a cranky young man? <laughs> um, but in any event, uh, there must be a lot of Americans out there today who are cranky about the way things are going because no sooner did his blog come out and my book floated straight up to the top of the Amazon list, and that took some doing because as uh, uh, you've heard, the book weighs two pounds. So it floated right up to the top, and the only thing that stopped it were two diet books, um, and, and another one called The Walking Dead, and uh, that apparently was a horror novel, but uh, you know some of the things that are going on in this country might fit in that zip code, at least that's what I'm uh, writing about. Now, uh, when we were uh, uh, gathering before the luncheon started, Senator Dernberger was um, eyeing the girth of my uh, book, and he was recollecting about the good old days in the Senate when I went before his committee and talked for two hours straight without taking a breath, and he uh, gently suggested that maybe I ought to condense my thoughts a little bit um, for this uh, presentation today. And so the good news is that I've thought about it hard and I've boiled it all the way down to five succinct sound bites. The bad news is that each one of them is 100 pages long, so uh, it'll take us a while to get uh, through them. Um, I want to start, though, with what I would call a preventative clarification because uh, I do not believe our country is heading in a good direction. I uh, think we're in another financial bubble, the third one of this decade. I don't think it's going to last much longer. I think there's going to be huge wreckage when this uh, bubble breaks. Uh, I think our economy has not recovered. I don't think things are fixed. Uh, I think we're doing more of the same, only even bigger, and it's going to lead to even worse results than we saw in 2008. And so I've generally been uh, accused of uh, kind of preaching a gloom and doom gospel. But I think I've been badly misinterpreted because, again, at that luncheon yesterday, uh, after the questions were all raised, someone said, okay, so in sum, after hearing all this bad news, you're telling us that we ought to, there's no safe place, the stock market is going to go down, bonds are in a big bubble, it's dangerous. You're telling us we need to put our money under a mattress, under our mattress. And I said, heavens no, I'm telling you, put your money in your mattress, because <laughs> that's probably uh, the only safe place that we're going to have. Now, of course, that kind of advice is a far cry from the booming stock market that we can see as we uh, sit here at lunch today. Uh, but I would say not exactly uh, so, because the S&P 500, as we uh, have lunch, is at about 560, the index number, and that's the same number that it was at, 5, uh, 1560, 4,750 days ago. And so for anybody who still does long division, divide by 365, carry the 10, and that's 13 years ago 
Uh, we were at the very same place that we are today. In the interim, we had two huge crashes, dot-com, five, six trillion dollars worth of 401ks and Main Street America uh, savings and uh, wealth uh, was lost. And then they reflated the bubble when Greenspan put the interest rates down, as you remember, to 1% in 02 and 03. In fact, Professor Krugman actually said publicly at the time, the dot-com is busted, there's carnage in the financial markets, Greenspan, you need to uh, restart a bubble. Why don't you start a housing bubble? So that's exactly what he did. We got this tremendous housing bubble, which was a disaster for America. It caused housing prices to soar in no sensible way. It was because cheap money was flooding Wall Street and from there flooded out uh, through the mortgage uh, system. We know what happened to millions of families who lost their homes, who got in too deep, or were induced to take on subprime mortgages and so forth that never should have been written uh, in the first place. And so uh, we inflated the bubble a second time, and it hit 1560, the S&P 500, in 2008. And then it crashed, and it was an even worse crash, seven, eight trillion dollars of loss uh, for middle-income uh, America, for Main Street America. And then they went right back to it within weeks, reflating the same bubble. The Fed was printing money like they've never done before. In fact, in the seven weeks after the Lehman collapse, the Fed created money, new money, out of thin air at $700 million an hour. Another way to uh, explain it is that the first 94 years of the Federal Reserve, some of you may know it was created in 1914, up until that point, 94 years, they'd increased the balance sheet by $900 billion over long periods of time, war and peace, prosperity and uh, recessions, good chairman of the Fed, bad, 94, bill, 94 years, $900 billion. Bernanke doubled it, $900 billion in seven weeks. And then he went on to triple it in 13 weeks, and that began the whole monetary flood that has been underway since the fall of 2008, when in my view they inappropriately bailed out Wall Street. I do not believe that that panic would have gone beyond Wall Street. I think there were two uh, uh, gambling houses left standing, Goldman and Morgan Stanley. They could have gone down into bankruptcy like anybody else who gets too leveraged, uh, who gets uh, too reckless in their investments, uh, who uh, 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 builds up uh, the kind of risk that they had. But instead, the Fed jumped in, the Treasury jumped in, we got TARP, and we basically uh, put an end, we disabled our financial system. Because if there are no consequences to risky behavior, if there's no consequences to too much debt, uh, they're going to just do more of it, and that's exactly what's happened. So I think today we're back at the same pla place that we were in 2007 and 2008, or 1999-2001. All the signs are everywhere that speculation and bubble finance is back. And you can see many of them around. The Fed has actually said we're going to keep interest rates at zero for five years. They put the interest rate, the overnight uh, rate, down to zero, as you remember, in December 2008. And they're going to keep it there through 2015. Now, when you tell people on Wall Street especially that money is uh, free, that overnight money is available through the Fed in the federal funds market on an unlimited basis uh, for free for five years, you're going to get some very bad behavior. So it's all back. Uh, we have triple C, uh, junk bonds, the, the most risky kind of junk bonds you can imagine today, trading to a yield of 5.5%. Now, given the risk that's involved in triple C junk bonds, there are companies that are near bankrupt. Uh, that is uh, an absurd rate. And yet, it is the kind of thing that is popping up everywhere. We saw it in the prior two uh, bus and it's back here again. We have subprime back in a big way, although, although this time not so much in housing but in automotive loans. So everybody said, isn't it great? Auto production is back, the industry is recovered. The truth is 40% of the loans being made today are subprime, which means that the credit scores of the borrowers are so low that the risk is very high. Uh, and you, know, you, you see examples, as like one I saw the other day, where uh, a subprime loan defaulted, and this is just uh, an anecdote, but I think it's uh, indicative of the kind of uh, uh, problem we have in our financial market. A subprime loan defaulted because the borrower, who had only a part-time job as a bar bartender, 
and a 500 uh, credit score, which is very low, had put up as a down payment a shotgun because he didn't have any cash and he was still able to get a subprime loan by putting up a shotgun uh, and a PlayStation uh, as collateral. So we have this going on throughout our financial markets. We, they say that there is a housing recovery underway and yet most of the places that were hit the hardest when the subprime housing crash occurred in the Sun Belt, uh, in Arizona, Southern California, Florida, are now booming again. Prices are up like 20 or 30 percent, but it's not because Main Street borrowers have gotten well or gotten new jobs or gotten more prosperous and, and can borrow. It's because overwhelmingly the money flowing in is from big institutions on Wall Street, hedge funds, LBO funds, who are going out into the neighborhoods buying up all these busted properties for a cheap price, holding them for a short trade, and will throw them back into the market as soon as they've captured a, a, a windfall. But you know, that isn't a healthy recovery, that isn't a healthy rebuilding of our economy. When you see uh, suits from Wall Street riding on the back of a fleet of John Deere tractors into Scottsdale, Arizona, buying single-family detached homes uh, that have lawns with crabgrass and trees uh, infested with insects. This is not a natural economic phenomena. It is an artifact of the Fed's interest rate repression policies, the zero rates, and the way our whole financial system is being twisted and deformed in, in, in which cheap money is flowing into speculation but not uh, into Main Street America. So I think if you look at what's going on today, you realize our system is in great trouble. And one of the examples I use, and you know, I am very firm that what the Fed is doing is not just a small mistake. It's not a debatable, you know, should they be a little uh, less easy? Should the interest rate be not 10 basis points, which you can't even measure, that's the overnight rate. Uh, should it be 50? No, they are so far off the deep end. They're so far into experiments that have never been even conceived uh, historically, at least prior to 1995 or 2000, that we are in great danger because they are twisting and distorting the basic financial markets of our country. There is no interest rate left. When the 10-year bond trades at 1.7 percent, that's the yield, when inflation is 2%, it means that the government is financing itself with negative real interest rates. That is not sustainable. That is not sensible. But it is not because the market has decided that deficits don't matter, as some of the uh, uh, Keynesians want you to believe. It's because the Fed is in the market every month buying $85 billion of bonds. They're buying over half of all the bonds that are being issued by the Treasury each month, and they have been for many years. And as a result of that, we have essentially disabled the pricing mechanism throughout our financial markets. Interest rates are set, rigged by the Fed, not by supply and demand for savings, not by the discounting of cash flow, not by the uh, you know, uh, estimation of the risk of any particular uh, bond or security going forward. And it's not only the in, uh, interest rate market or fixed income market that's under this spell, so is the whole stock market, so are the commodity markets. All of them trade against the Fed, the massive inflow of cash going into the market every day. Do you realize the Fed is in the market every day injecting eight or 10 billion dollars of cash which immediately flows into various speculative venues. It doesn't get out of uh, Wall Street and it is not helping the economy. Wall Street has become a casino which is all secondary trading. There is very little new capital being raised for long-term investment in productive assets that might generate jobs, growth, and wealth creation over time. And so I think the way to symbolize how far this has gotten off the beaten path and how dangerous it is, is my little uh, uh, comparison of Granny and Goldman Sachs. And, you know, I'm not necessarily trying to beat up on Goldman Sachs as much as uh, they probably deserve it, but I think they're a good symbol 
for uh, the problem we have in our system, and it's not that there are evil people running these banks. It's when the Fed makes it so easy to speculate, when the Fed actually shovels free money at speculators and fast traders and hedge funds and so forth, they're going to do what their DNA tells them to do. They're going to go out and gamble, and that's exactly what's going on. But let me give you the example of why our economy is failing because of the failure at the heart of our capitalistic system, which is the financial markets. If someone had spent a lifetime doing the right thing, observing the values that we were all taught about, frugality, saving, preparing for the future, preparing for retirement, and had managed to save $100,000 in a lifetime, maybe by being a little more frugal than their neighbor, maybe not buying a new car every year and so forth, where would that retired couple be today? They would be earning $400 on $100,000 of lifetime achievement, savings, frugality, because the monetary politburo, as I call it, the 12 people running the Fed today, the self-annoyed super managers of the entire economy, riggers of the entire financial markets, have decided that that's all they're entitled to earn, and if they want something more on their savings, they need to go into junk bonds, or they need to go into the stock market, or they need to buy into so-called risk assets because the Fed has decreed this is how we're going to run the economy. Now I want to tell you that is so wrong that it is a measure of how far off the deep end we really are. Twenty years ago no one would have even thought the Federal Reserve could tell Granny she has to go into a junk bond fund in order to even make a, a minimal return on a lifetime worth of investment. Now, on the other hand, today, because the cheap money, as I say, never gets out of Wall Street and doesn't uh, flow into the Main Street economy, today, Goldman Sachs this morning could go out and buy $1 billion worth of treasuries, collect the yield of 1.7%, which is a you know, considerable number on a billion, and immediately, this nanosecond, post the billion dollars worth of treasuries, as collateral for a so-called repo loan, that's overnight loan that they can uh, get on Wall Street because the Fed has pegged it, at 10 basis points. So if you think about the spread, you own a billion and you're earning 1.7, 170 basis points, so let's say, you borrow 98 cents on the dollar of that billion in the repo market, you pay 10 basis points, the difference is 160 base, uh, basis points, $50,000 a day for doing nothing, and you laugh all the way to the bank, and you sleep at night because Bernanke has said he's going to keep the repo rate at 10% or 10 basis points for the next uh, two or three years, and they're in the market buying the bond, the asset, the 10-year, propping up the price. Now this is how our financial system is working today. So is there any uh, wonder that the economy isn't really recovering? Is there any wonder that even though today the market, the stock market, is where it was 13 years ago, as I said, that the performance of the real economy over that same 13-year period does not reflect any of the exuberance that you can see uh, in the market today? What has happened during that same 13 years to Main Street? Well, number one, real median family income is down 8%. Okay, so there has been no recovery in Main Street uh, uh, income. Net worth of, main, of the top bottom 90% of American households is down 25%. During that same 13 years, we have created new jobs at the annual, at the rate of 0.1% a year. In other words, it's not even measurable. We have essentially created no new jobs since the year 2000. We've had a few born-again jobs, that is, jobs that were created in the first Greenspan bubble. They disappeared in 08 and 09. Some of them have been recreated in the so-called recovery, but guess what? Last month, there was 135 million new jobs, or 135 million payroll jobs reported in the U.S. economy. The same number we first hit in the spring of 2005, and only slightly above where it was in March 2000. 
So you could talk about many other financial indicators, but the point is all of this money printing, all of this bubble finance by the Fed is not helping our economy and it's turning the financial markets into a gambling casino and thereby undermining our long-term prospects. Give you one example of that. I think everybody understands, especially businesses here, that it, you cannot have an economy growing over time if you don't have investment in plant and equipment. That's sort of basic. Everybody knows that. But in the last 13 years that we've been through the, uh, now into the third bubble, two crashes, uh, three boom and bust cycles, business investment is averaged 1% a year, I mean, in real terms. The lowest in recorded history, even I think it was worse than the, than the Depression, actually. So therefore, we're not investing in the future. We're simply churning uh, in the financial markets the existing wealth of society, and strangely enough, it's ending up more and more to the top. Uh, this kind of policy basically is a implicit mechanism for transferring wealth and income to the 1%. It's not their intention, but that's what happens when you turn fin the financial system into a casino because you disable interest rates, you disable pricing, you flood uh, the market with uh, cheap money. Now, yesterday a study came out, and I cited uh, sort of the same thing in my book. A study came out that said, let's look at the uh, results of the first two years of the so-called recovery. T 209 obviously was the bottom. If we look at household wealth, we see that the top 7% of households have had a 28% gain in net worth. If we look at the bottom 93% of households in this two years of so-called recovery, their net worth has declined 4%. Now, you only need to do that for a few years, and all of the chips are going to end up in a very few places. Now, if that were the extent of the problem, uh, a Wall Street that is basically a casino, a Fed that is flooding the market with cheap money and punishing the savers of America and the fixed income uh, people of America, it would be bad enough. But what it's further doing is enabling Congress to continue to fiddle while Rome burns on the question of the deficit. Because when you can borrow money so artificially that f as far as Washington is concerned, it's the same thing as uh, free money. Today, they can borrow money for five years, which is a heck of a long period of time, for 70 basis points. I mean, Washington doesn't do decimal fractions. fractions. <laughs> And so therefore, as they view it, the politicians in both parties, as they view it, it's the same thing as free money. And so therefore, you know, I've been there, uh, the two senators have been there, Congressman Kui was there a long time. You know that if there isn't some fear, if there isn't some worry about bad things happening, politicians aren't going to be courageous. They are not going to fall on the sword. They're not going to make the tough choices. They're not going to level with the public about what we really face. And so I say that the Fed and Bernanke are the enablers of the most extreme period of fiscal irresponsibility that we've ever had in this country. And therefore, they kicked the can and you saw silly things like even on New Year's Day, they had a chance to let all the Bush tax cuts expire, which we never could afford in the first place, and I'm totally off the Republican reservation on that. The Democrats spent 11 years criticizing the Bush tax cuts as the worst thing ever done, and they were right about that. And we get to New Year's Day, we have a chance to let them expire. No one has to vote. No one has to show their hand. Just let them expire because the law was uh, uh, triggered to expire. And what did they do? They all jumped on board and extended them permanently for 98% of the population. That cost $4 trillion over the next 10 years and a lot more as we go forward. So therefore, when you look at the true picture on our deficit and you look at the total paralysis in Congress, when you look at the lack of incentive to face the problem, then you have to be very worried about where we're going fiscally. I believe we will be at 20 trillion of national debt soon, we're at 17. I believe the forces built in in a realistic view of the weak economy that we're struggling with means that we'll be at 30 trillion of national debt by the time we get into the next decade, the 2020s, and it's not that far away. 
we'll be at 150% uh, debt to GDP. We know what happens from looking all around the world when you get to that position. So therefore, everything is going in the wrong direction, and that's why I end up uh, where I do. The budget has become a doomsday machine. Uh, the Fed is a serial bubble machine. The Wall Street has become a casino. In the last 10 years, we've, we've actually uh, liquidated three and a half trillion worth of stock. In other words, the financial markets are actually basically for raising capital to invest for the long haul in businesses that have some kind of good product or good uh, strategy. But in the last 15 years, we've liquidated three and a half trillion of equity through stock buybacks, cash mergers, LBOs, and all the rest of it. And that isn't natural. That's not the free market at work. That is cheap money coming out of the Federal Reserve, twisting and distorting what our financial system will do. So therefore, our economy, I believe, is in a, for a long twilight of austerity, of uh, start and stop, of weak growth, uh, and there is no uh, way around that. Because for the last 30 years, we've been living high on the hog, massive increase in public and private debt. We're now in the payback time, and yet our institutions can't deal with it. The Fed is doing the wrong thing. It's encouraging people to borrow. The last thing we should do, given the leverage ratios in our uh, system. The Fed is encourage, encouraging the politicians to massively build the federal debt. The last thing we should be doing right now, because remember, the baby boom is retiring. Our society is getting old. We haven't reinvested in our economy. We have offshored much of our productive capacity in manufacturing and so forth. In that environment, you ought to start reining in things. You ought to start imposing discipline. You ought to start preparing uh, for the even larger uh, burdens we're going to face uh, as the retirement age increases. We're in a world where the Cold War ended 25 years ago, and yet we have a defense budget that was bigger under this peace president we had today than what uh, George Bush, the war president, left on his doorstep. And I want to tell you, it is way too big. Eisenhower warned us in 1960, and it's part of my book about the military industrial complex, his budget in today's dollars was 400 billion. We had an enemy then, the Soviet Union. The Kremlin had hostile intentions. Here we are today with a budget 60% bigger in the same dollars when we have no industrial enemies left in the world. Remember, the Soviet Union is gone. Russia is a kleptocracy. They're more interested in stealing from each other than they are harming their neighbors. Uh, you know, the same thing is true with China. China is the Apple and uh, Nike capital of the world. They can't function, they can't survive without massive exporting. So are they really going to bomb 3,000 Walmarts in America <laughs> if they turn hostile? And besides that, how are they going to do it? Because, you know, we, we have this huge defense budget partly because we have 11 aircraft carriers with all the escort ships and the planes and the electronic warfare suites and so forth. How many uh, carrier battle groups does China have? Answer, one. Where did they get it? They bought it used from the Ukraine. Where did the Ukraine get it? They stole it from the Soviet Union when it collapsed in 1990. Now, my point is, if you look at all of these points of demarcation. Why do we have this massive war machine when we have no industrial state enemies? Why does the Fed keep printing money for zero and creating the casino on Wall Street and the windfalls to the 1% when our Main Street economy is suffering and uh, has been uh, declining for years? Why does Congress continue to fiddle and do silly things like extend the Bush tax cuts uh, and all the other uh, mistakes that have been made when we have a national debt of the magnitude that we have facing us. Well, these are just some indications of the breakdown that has occurred in our system, and at the end of the day, regrettably, I think it is in the parties themselves. When we were all in the Senate and in the Congress uh, fighting these issues in the 70s and 80s, at least I believe the parties stood for something. Uh, and you could debate issues, and if you didn't have a majority, you would find a compromise and you would work a solution. 
I believe today the political parties have been reduced to the status of glorified concierges. And by that I mean they introduce politicians to money and to political action committees and to the machinery of re-election, but they really don't stand for anything. Or how could the Republicans have bailed out in 208 Wall Street, AIG, uh, the automotive companies and so forth? If they ever stood for anything, it was free markets and that wasn't free markets. The Democrats elected a peace uh, president twice, and yet the defense budget is as big as it ever was. So I think those are only indications of how uh, broken and dysfunctional our system is. Now, what does this lead to? It leads to a very tough future, and I'm just trying to give you an unvarnished view from 20 years in Washington and 20 years on Wall Street, and we have to face up the facts because Wall Street won't tell you this, Washington won't tell you this, uh, they uh, want you to believe it's all fixed, it's getting better. It isn't. And uh, one of these days, we're going to have a large uh, collapse, collision in our financial markets. There's no way around it. The bond market is the greatest bubble ever created. That isn't real. It's entirely as a result of what the Fed is doing. Unfortunately, when you get a wake-up call because there is a massive collapse in the financial system, it's very painful to deal with it in the aftermath. And I wish I could give you a formula for how we can avoid that. What are the six things we need to do? The, they're pretty obvious, but they're not going to happen because of the way our system uh, has been deformed, as I call it in my book, uh, and distorted over a period of time. So um, that's chapter one. And uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, the, more, uh, the more difficult parts I've reserved for private discussion afterwards. Thank you all very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I tried to preempt that at the beginning by saying put it in a mattress, and I guess now you see why I said that. But what I really mean by it is the very unfortunate thing happening is that honest people, prudent people, conservative people have no choice except to put your money in short-term securities like treasury bills or bank accounts where you'll earn nothing. That's what your overlords have decided you deserve for being prudent, conservative, and cautious, and worrying about a future which uh, I think maybe is not as bad as I say, but it ain't, it is, there's no reason why miracles of recovery are gonna happen. So that's the answer. You need to stay in cash. I don't think there is going to be any huge inflation because the bond market will collapse long before we get to that, and the economy will go into a stall. That is unfortunate, and that's why the people of the country ought to be upset with 12 men running the Fed, unelected, who are basically deciding that if you don't play along and keep your money safe, uh, you're going to have to go out and buy uh, junk bonds and take your chances. That is uh, just a measure of the deformation. I run a manufacturing company with 170 employees. We pay the government over 50 cents of every dollar in gross income in taxes. Uh, I've heard you in the media claiming we should increase taxes. This will cost jobs. Come. Uh, that's a good, uh, the question is if we raise taxes, which I believe we have to, it'll cost jobs, and my answer is yes, it will. And my further answer is sooner or later we have to pay our bills in this country. We can't say, well, let's wait another year. We've had 14 deficits in a row. The last six have been in the trillion dollar range. Let's wait another year or two and see if the economy is a little stronger and then maybe we'll get around to paying our bills. We have been doing that for so long now that the, de de the budget is becoming a doomsday machine. It can't be stopped. This debt is dangerous. Do you realize that when we get 20 trillion of national debt, we'll be there in a couple years, and interest rates normalize, which they have to. You can't have zero interest rates forever because if you do, the whole system will collapse into uh, you know, an economic uh, Armageddon. 
When interest rates normalize, and that would be, let's say, 5% on average rather than 2, which is what the uh, Treasury is paying today, it will raise spending by six or seven hundred billion a year just for interest. We get nothing for it. It'll squeeze out the NIH. It'll squeeze out research. It'll squeeze out any the public parks, anything else that you think is important. Uh, and that's really hidden today. It should be in the numbers. It's one. It's hidden as a result of this artificial, phony monetary policy. So uh, that when you put all that together, I think you have some. Uh, indication of why we have to pay our bills and that means raising revenue and I know it's going to cost job, jobs but if a society wants to spend 24 percent of GDP which is what we're spending then it's going to have to pay for it and there's always a cost to having a government of this size uh, but I, I see no way around it. We have a number of uh, prospective college students here in okay. some high schools um, and parents I'm sure that are uh, looking at student loan debt. So what do you believe will happen with a massive student loan debt? Uh, the student loan debt is the next uh, you know, uh, time bomb to hit us, and I think people are aware of that. But the number is $1 trillion. There's a $1 trillion worth of student debt outstanding now, which is even more than credit card debt, by the way, which is only $800 billion. But the, the fact is uh, that student debt is going to have a profound impact on the entire generation now in school because in their wisdom, Congress changed the law in 205. You can't discharge in bankruptcy student debt, not that I'm recommending it. But as a result, millions of young people in America are becoming debt slaves, debt serfs for the rest of their life because they're in being induced to take on all of this cheap money. The interest rate's only three and a half percent and you don't pay until you start. You're no longer in student status. So obviously what's happening is people are staying in student status as long as they can. And we're creating a monster which will have many bad effects. It will demoralize a generation and it'll prevent many of them from ever uh, buying a home. You know, we keep hearing about the housing market's going to recover. It can't recover unless you have first-time buyers. If you have a whole generation burdened with massive student debts and interest to pay once they uh, get out of student status, they'll never accumulate a down payment. And so now we have the government saying, yeah, that's a problem. Let's give people FHA mortgages again with no down payment. And here we go, right back into the subprime soup. So we are creating one dilemma, one problem after another, out of the basic idea that has taken hold in our society that debt is a wonderful tonic, it will solve every problem, households should borrow, students should borrow, homeowners should cash out all the equity in their home in order to go out and you know, buy uh, another flat screen TV or a granite kitchen top uh, counter or whatever. Uh, that is a disease that has set in for the last 20 or 30 years and now we're totally caught up in it because if we actually tried to start savings, you know our savings rate is 2 percent, it's ridiculous. Our savings rate was always 8 or 10 percent prior to 1980. If we started saving in this country to prepare belatedly for the retirement of a whole generation, it would slow down our economy even more in the short run. So we're caught in this debt spiral that is really a very dangerous thing. None of your leaders will talk to you about it because uh, they're trying to kick the can by the week and the month and pretend it isn't there. It's there. There's 56 trillion of debt on the U.S. balance sheet, households, business, government, and financial institutions. A staggering number. It is nearly four times GDP. Historically, our debt and on this basis was only one and a half times GDP. So again, the student debt problem is only one more symptom of the generic debt problem we have in our society. If you were the executive director of a $60 billion public pension fund, what would you do over the next few years? Uh, retire. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, the, the, uh, th th this is really unfair to the pension funds because a lot of pension fund managers want to be uh, reasonably conservative. They don't want to get too extended out in, say, uh, risky credits or in uh, uh, too big a proportion of stocks. So now they want to buy the treasury. 
But really, I ask a pension fund manager, why in the world do you want to buy a 10-year treasury bond yielding 1.7% when the inflation rate is 2 to 2.5%, uh, has been, will be, uh, for as far as the eye can see? You're, you're losing money for your clients, for your fiduciaries. But that's the dilemma they face. If they go into cash, as I suggested any prudent uh, person would do, they make nothing and they get fired. So their choices are to be prudent, make nothing, and get fired, uh, or to retire uh, and uh, you know, avoid the problem. This sounds uh, cynical. This sounds uh, uh, you know, totally unreasonable. But this is where the leaders of our institution have put more and more responsible people in our society who have to deal with things like managing uh, pension funds. On The Daily Show, John Stewart pushed you to consider government regulation as beneficial. You were not persuaded. <laughs> Fifty years ago, my father bought regulated utility stocks and received a reliable yield of 7%. Isn't this a good thing? <laughs> well, uh, the uh, John Stewart Show, The Daily Show, some of you may watch, um, you know, it was an interesting experience for me because I finally realized that maybe I wrote a little too much uh, in this book because he began the show by saying, uh, I had a chance to read your book on a recent trip that I took to Mars. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but uh, the, the discussion that we had was really about regulation and what I said was, Banks need to be regulated strictly. Repealing Glass-Steagall was a huge mistake because banks really are wards of the state. They are not free enterprise institutions. If they want to have deposit insurance, which the taxpayers stand behind, and there's moral hazard with deposit insurance if banks don't have to worry about uh, their depositors staying put. If they want to have access to the so-called discount loan window, the cheap money at the Fed, if they get in trouble on their balance sheet, then they have to submit to being strictly regulated so that the money that they can raise from depositors isn't used to gamble. So my view is Glass-Steagall II or Super Glass-Steagall, we need to break up these big banks, put a limit on their size. If they want to be gambling houses like Goldman Sachs, fine, but they have to go out in the free market, no bailouts, no deposit insurance, no access to the Fed, that would be okay. But if you want to have those benefits of government, then you need to have strict regulation. Utilities, they need to be regulated because they're monopolies. Uh, so, you know, part of this whole debate about free markets and regulation, I think, is really misplaced. Most of the economy is in the world economy. You can't regulate it. Regu I mean, you can't uh, control it and regulate it. Uh, regulation fails. In the banking system, however, and in things like utilities, you do need regulation. As a member of Generation X, what ought we to do when the number of people in the proverbial wagon exceeds the number of people pulling? Isn't the math against us? Yeah, the math is against us and it's go going against us very rapidly. It's one of the points that I uh, have been making, but uh, I'll just summarize it. If you went back to 2000, again, the last time the stock market was booming where it is today, there were 75 million people of adult age, 16 and over, who weren't working. Today, there are 102 million people of adult age not working. 27 million people, uh, 27 million increase just in the last 13 years. And when I bring this up and point to the problem, one, it shows that our economy is failing because they're not getting jobs. Two, these people have been sort of flushed down the black hole and now they're on food stamps or on disability or moved in with their parents or whatever. Uh, when I point that out, the Keynesians, Krugman says, uh, hey, you don't know what you're talking about. These are all retired people. Our, our, our uh, society is getting older. The truth is, the number of people on old age retirement in that same period, 2000 to today, is up 6 million. And the number of people uh, of adult age not working is up 27 million. So what happened to the other 21 million? They have fallen into the social safety net. They have fallen into des desperation. They have been left behind by this wonderful casino, uh, you know, borrow until uh, you, you drop system 
that uh, we're trying to run our economy on. And I'm only mentioning it because it's going to get ra uh, worse rapidly. Uh, there will be 120, 125 million people in this category soon. And guess how many people are actually holding jobs last month? 135 million. So what I'm saying is we're rapidly approaching the point where there is almost the same number of adults dependent on society uh, one way or another as are working. And uh, that is just another reason why you can't expect uh, great miracles of recovery and so forth uh, going forward. Simpson Bowles. Um, two words that uh, uh, make sense to everybody in America except people inside the Beltway, okay? And that's the, that's the problem. Uh, I think if we just randomly selected a Senate out of this room, including as our leaders, the two ex-senators we have in here and the ex-chairman of the House Education, and, or not chairman, ranking member of the House Education and Labor Committee, they could sit down and figure out in a short period of time a version of uh, Simpson-Bowles that would dramatically put, um, improve our fiscal uh, uh, equation and put us on some kind of sustainable path. Uh, they, they actually could. And so therefore, you may say, well, you're so doom and gloomy about everything. If that's true, we could pick a, a group and do it in a half hour here. How come you can't solve the problem? And my answer would be, one of the kind of radical reforms I have in my book, because I did have 720 pages of analysis and 10 pages of solutions, okay? Um, but one of the solutions is abolish incumbency. And someone said, what does that mean? It means make the terms six years for the House, the Senate, and the President, and forbid them from ever running for re-election. They get one shot. It's a citizen uh, legislator. Um, and, and the thing about it is they would not spend day and night worrying about re-election, raising money, going to fundraisers, kowtowing to PACs, placating all the lobbies, on uh, K Street, we have gone so far into money politics that there is no solution to this except radical constitutional reform. That's what that would take. No re-election, one six-year term, a citizen legislature, public money only in campaigns, abolish union corporate contributions, rich man contributions, any contributions, public money for the one time that you can stand for re-election, and have a six or eight week campaign, get it over with, get back to governing. While we're at it, repeal Citizens United. It's terrible. Put a uh, standard on the books that if you were ever on the legislative payroll or a member of the Congress, you can't be a lobbyist for the rest of your life. Do those things, hey, and while we're at it, repeal the Electoral College because that's, <laughs> you know, that's really uh, antiquated and Asian, uh, ancient. If you put that package together, maybe you could rescue the machinery of our democracy from the special interests and the money that totally controls it today. But short of that, uh, it's, it's very difficult to see how we can work out of these problems. What are your plans for 2016? <laughs> uh, well, look, at the, my plans on that is I, I was run out of Washington on a rail tarred and feathered to boot in 1985, I learned my lesson. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not particularly wanted there, so uh, we'll leave it at that. Well, let's give a round of applause to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's clear he's an equal opportunity uh, uh, cri criticizer of uh, everything that we hold dear. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, the senators for coming. Uh, Governor Quee, thank you for being here, and all the other elected officials. Lake Area Booksellers is out in the lobby area, and they have uh, Mr. Stockman's book for sale, and you'll be out there signing it. Yep. Pretty neat deal. Uh, thank you very much for coming to this uh, event today. The White Barrier Chamber is uh, very appreciative of your attendance. Have a good day.